So I guess you can uh, hear me and you can uh, see the slides. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I'm John Kiriako and uh, I, today I want to tell you about the uh, work I did, some of the work I did during uh, my PhD at Columbia. Uh, uh, and uh, particularly this uh, work focus on um, uh, the, the, the driving of the, the metering to the transition in uh, calcium rutinate uh, and how this can be explained uh, by uh, heating effects and faulty effects. So just to give a bit of an overview and introduction to, to the topic. Um, now, uh, metering to the transitions are, uh, have been very studied in, uh, uh, in recent years. And in equilibrium, they can be uh, driven by many uh, tuning parameters, like for example, temperature, strain, doping, and uh, uh, many more. Like you can see just an example in uh, this phase diagram here, which is for uh, uh, calcium rutinate doped with strontium. And uh, depending on temperature or uh, doping, you can have many different phases in this material. This is just in equilibrium. Uh, but then uh, recently there have been uh, uh, many experiments uh, performed out of equilibrium. So in which the uh, certain material is, uh, the, the transition in a certain material is driven uh, through uh, electric currents or electric fields. And uh, you can see this in, uh, in the phase diagram always for uh, calcium wood and this material in which you have as tuning parameters, the temperature, and the applied current, and you can uh, drive many non-equilibrium phases uh, through the application of this current. And now these experiments have been uh, focused mostly on the uh, on inducing the metering solar transition in motor insulators. And there was uh, one example which was uh, famous uh, uh, some, some years ago, uh, which is the, uh, the experiments performed on uh, uh, vanadium oxide, VO2. Uh, in which initially the transition was thought to uh, be due, like the driven transition through the electric field, initially was thought to be due uh, to purely electronic mechanisms. So there was something at the level of the electronic structure of the material which was changed by the electric field, but then it turned out to be just heating of the system caused by a uh, dual heating of uh, due to the electric field. And you can see just from, uh, from this table uh, how like, how many materials uh, have been studied, and how many materials this uh, metering through the transition driven by fields has, has been studied. And what is uh, uh, peculiar about this material, about calcium rutinate, is that the uh, uh, threshold field, the breakdown field required to uh, switch from the insulating phase to the metallic phase is very, is, is very small. So it's like three or four orders of magnitude smaller than uh, uh, what happens than the field required in uh, the other material. Uh, so uh, during my PhD, I decided to kind of focus and try to understand what is going on in, uh, in this material. Now, understanding how this non-equilibrium phase transitions work is also a challenge, not only from uh, the experimental point of view, so not only from the point of view of modeling what was exactly happening in the material, but also on a more uh, theoretical uh, standpoint of view. So like uh, the first issue, of course, is to understand whether uh, the mechanism that is driving the transition when you apply the electric field to, to your material is just electronic in nature. So you are messing around with the uh, structure of the uh, electronic model or you're just heating up the system. So like your uh, sort of pseudo uh, equilibrium transition in which you just uh, raise the temperature of the system. And then more on the theoretical side, there is the question of how we study this uh, electric field driven state and whether we can uh, use some sort of pseudo free energy functional uh, to study an equilibrium transition uh, similar to what we do in, in equilibrium with the Landau free energy to obtain the various phases of the, of the system. Now in, uh, in this talk, I, this talk will be uh, divided mainly in uh, two parts. So first I will be talking about some possible microscopic theories of this uh, uh, transition from uh, insulator to metal driven by uh, an applied voltage. And then I will focus more specifically on the case of uh, calcium rutinate and how this can be explained by uh, some uh, uh, Peltier and thermoelectric effects. So uh, more on, the, on these theoretical uh, models, 
uh, there is the question like how we how does the uh, current or uh, field applied to the system uh, actually drive the, the transition so uh, the usual models we consider are uh, systems with a certain bandwidth w a gap delta so there is an insulin phase and a metallic phase and the insulin phase has a certain gap delta and usually there is also like some uh, interaction strength because these are uh, correlated systems so there is a competition between uh, on site interaction between electrons and then uh, hopping so kinetic term and then there is the temperature t and all these parameters determine the equilibrium phase diagram and uh, uh, these systems usually so have this uh, inserting phase with a conduction balance band and they can be studied by different uh, techniques. So one way to study the systems is to model them uh, using the Hubbard model and then apply, for example, an equilibrium dynamical field theory. Uh, so this uh, more numerical approach. And then there, is a more there are more analytical approaches in which uh, these uh, systems are modeled with uh, some toy models. So for example, systems with uh, antiferromagnetic or charge density uh, insulating phases. Uh, and then you, up, you insert also in this system some relaxation process in, and then apply a mean field and you try to get some analytical results from, uh, from these models. And of course, as I was, was mentioning, there is uh, this um, uh, theoretical issue of uh, this non-equilibrium pseudo-free energy, which is not clear uh, uh, how to define, like it's, it's not clear exactly how to define this uh, pseudo-free energy and uh, what are uh, its properties. Uh, while well, it's of course clear for uh, the equilibrium Landau free energy. So now for what concerns uh, some possible driving mechanism of uh, uh, these transitions. Uh, one for the, the simplest one is just a, a static deformation of the energy bands uh, due to the presence of the electric field. So there is these electric fields and then uh, the energy structure of the system is changed. Uh, and this can lead to just like a closing of the gap in the insulating phase. So the system becomes metallic because you are uh, uh, no longer, you don't no longer have a gap in the uh, electronic structure. Then you have a, uh, the me a mechanism of uh, Landau's inner tunneling, which is just a tunneling from, of electrons from a conduction band uh, to valence band. So basically you are uh, exciting some, uh, some electrons that now are free to move and free to um, uh, conduct. So like you have, uh, uh, it's possible like you, uh, through the electric field, you induce a current and then this leads to the stabilization of the insulating phase. And then there is the, uh, there are heating mechanisms which uh, you can only heat the, the electrons uh, of the system or you can also heat uh, the electrons and uh, the lattice structure. So you're just heating the entire system. And uh, this, uh, these two mechanisms can, uh, can be different so there, there is like some subtlety in uh, when they are important and for example if uh, the order parameter associated to this transition is purely electronic so it's just related to uh, the nature of uh, the electronic phase then it doesn't matter whether we are heating up only the electrons or both the electrons and the lattice but for example if there is some uh, uh, coupled order parameters at the transition so like if both the lattice and the electrons of your system uh, change the, the transition then it's possible like only heating up the, the electrons is not enough to drive the transition so you also need to consider heating up the lattice so there is this uh, slight difference that can be important in some cases so uh, just to give an idea uh, when we talk about the deformation of the band structure uh, like from a very intuitive point of view uh, we can have a simple picture in which uh, so if you consider your system, your lattice uh, made up of different unit cells with a uh, unit cell length of A, then uh, uh, electrons between on neighboring unit cells, neighboring sites have an energy difference but approximately proportional to A and then times the electric field E and then the electric charge. So when this energy difference is proportional to the gap of the insulating phase delta, then you're basically uh, closing the gap of the insulating phase, like you make the conduction balance band touch. Uh, so you, you're essentially transforming your insulator into a metal. But this, um, uh, this effect usually requires very large fields, uh, like uh, the order of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 volts per centimeters. 
So it's not really uh, the uh, mechanism which is going on in uh, many of the materials or in calcium wood, because in uh, these materials, the required field, the threshold fields are uh, much smaller. Then there is the uh, mechanism of Landau's inner tunneling, uh, in which, as we were saying, there is this, uh, the possibility of this tunneling between conduction and valence bands, you're just exciting electrons across the gap of the insulating phase. And uh, in uh, correlated materials, usually when uh, the gap depends self consistently on uh, how many particles you have in uh, conduction band and valence band. So if you are uh, exciting electrons to valence band, then basically you uh, can reduce this uh, insulating gap so you, you can uh, uh, break down the insulator. Now, this uh, the, in the Landau Zinner tunneling, the probability. So there is uh, a rate which is proportional uh, to the electric field E. Then this rate is multiplied by the tunneling probability, which of course is suppressed exponentially by how large the gap is. And in particular, it's given by this formula here. So you have an exponential, which is exponential minus the gap squared over the electric field. So this is the, the quantity that uh, uh, tells you how important this uh, mechanism is. And usually the threshold fee required to have this uh, landau zinner uh, breakdown of the insulator is uh, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 volts per centimeter. So it's better than this uh, mechanism here, the static de deformation of bands, but it's still a very high, uh, high field. But also tells you that small gaps, insulators with small gaps are, um, are easier to switch. Uh, now I want to show you some. Uh, more uh, uh, detailed models of like, uh, for example, correlated systems in which there, uh, uh, there is a breakdown of the insulating phase caused by electric field. And uh, this is a model uh, from a work by Mazza, Marici, uh, Capone and Fabrizio. It was done here in Trieste some years ago. And basically what they do is they take um, uh, two bands Hubbard model. So, they have the usual Hubbard model for electrons, and then they consider electrons living on two bands so that they can uh, have a coexistence of insulating and metallic phase depending on the uh, interaction strength of the, of the model. Uh, so like for uh, a certain, uh, certain range of interaction strength, there is a coexistence of insulator and metal. For large interactions, there is an insulating behavior, and for small interactions, there is a, a metallic phase. And what they find is that, uh, when you start only from the uh, metallic phase, then uh, the only when you start from the uh, insulating phase, then uh, the insulator can collapse thanks to uh, Landau's inner tunneling. So they find that this mechanism actually uh, can collapse the, the insulator. But then they also find that in the coexistence region, you actually need smaller fields because uh, when you have, um, this coexistence, uh, so these two phase, phases coexisting, they both elect some, uh, uh, some free energy. So you, like, you can draw the free energy depending on the uh, order parameter. And what you need is for your electric field to just modify uh, one, the energy of the two phases enough, also that like the metallic phase becomes favored compared to the insulating phase. So just a sort of a free energy minimization balance. And uh, define that like in this case, you don't need uh, the large fields required to have Landau Zinner breakdown, but uh, you can have a transition for uh, smaller fields. Uh, then there is another model uh, in this like uh, more recent paper uh, by Matthias and uh, collaborators, in which they again study Hubbard model using dynamical field theory, and they have uh, an insulating phase with a charge density wave order. Uh, but it's like it's not really important what the order is; it's just that. There is this insulating phase um, with a uh, gap which is uh, determined self consistently by uh, the distribution of the electrons. And then they add some dissipation. So they have, they add, they couple this uh, system to an external buff which determines the, the temperature. And they add dissipation. So they allow for the exchange uh, of electrons between the system, the Hubbard system, and this external buff. And they find uh, one that uh, you need uh, an, or, uh, an electric field, which is of the order of the insulating gap to collapse the insulator. So again, they find that you need uh, some very large electric fields to uh, destroy the insulating phase. 
And then they also find that uh, the electrons are heated up. So to, to an effective temperature, which is determined by the E squared, so the Joule heating term, uh, divided by the dissipation rate. So how efficient you dissipate uh, energy into the, uh, uh, into the bar. And basically they, they see this by looking at the uh, electronic distribution f of omega's function of the energy omega. And they find that it can be fitted by a Fermi Dirac distribution uh, with a renormalized temperature. So when you, when you increase the voltage, it's like you are uh, increasing the effective temperature of your, of, your, of your electrons. So they basically see that there is this uh, heating effect of the, um, of the electrons. And something similar happens in uh, another model, another uh, work, which is, uh, so this, uh, this model is a one-dimensional uh, antiferromagnetic model with the uh, metallic sweater transition. And again, uh, the, the electrons are coupled to an external buff, uh, which is assumed to be at zero temperature. And there is a certain dissipation rate of energy between uh, the electrons in, uh, in the system and the, elect and, uh, the fermionic buff. And uh, again, what they, uh, what uh, this, um, uh, what Han and collaborators find in this paper is that there is a renormalization of the electronic temperature for both the metallic phase and the insulating phase with the, uh, with the effective temperature, which can be different between the, uh, the two phases, like the normalization effect can be uh, different and is stronger in, uh, in the metal usually but it's always uh, related to the strength of the electric field. So uh, the larger the field you apply to the system, uh, the big, the larger the uh, renormalized effective temperature is. And you also find again that you can collapse the insulating phase uh, if the number of excited uh, electrons uh, due to Landau's inner tunneling is uh, enough to destabilize the, uh, the insulator. And, uh, what they do actually is also uh, to study the uh, phase diagram. So they study the uh, behavior of the gap of the intruding phase delta as function of the applied electric field. And they see uh, that like if you start from the insulating phase, then uh, you need to go up to a certain large field to collapse the insulating phase. So above this threshold, there, is, uh, there can be only a metallic phase. But then once you are in the metallic phase, then you can decrease the field uh, down to a much lower value. And at this point, the metallic phase becomes unstable and you go back to the insulating phase. So they find that there is a large hysteresis cycle. Uh, and this is essentially due to the fact that uh, the renormalization of the, of the temperature is uh, larger in, uh, in the metallic phase. So when you apply the electric field to the metallic phase, you have uh, larger dissipation. So like uh, larger Joule heating production. So you have a larger increase of the effective temperature and basically you can stabilize this metallic phase to down to much lower temperature. And what they, they do is also um, use a phenomenological uh, uh, pseudo free energy for the non-equilibrium phase, uh, which is uh, here is just like a schematic picture. They, I don't think they actually have a formula for uh, uh, for this free energy, but like you can look at the uh, minima of the of the free energy to find the uh, the values of the of the insulating gap determined by this free energy. So the the values where the gap is satisfies the self consistent equations of the system. And then uh, I just want to show you uh, this uh, this other model, which is uh, part of the work I did uh, during the PhD, my PhD. And uh, in this work, we introduce a new mechanism uh, in which we can destabilize an uh, insulating phase in a, a correlated system. So we study a one-dimensional system with a uh, charge density wave order. So there is a, an insulating phase uh, with a certain gap delta, uh, which is determined self consistently by how many electrons you have in conduction and balance band. It's like a BCS-like uh, self-consistent equation. And uh, what we consider a sort of dynamic picture in which we have the electric field, which is uh, changing the distribution of the electrons, of the thermal electrons in the conduction balance band. And then we have, um, we consider several uh, relaxation processes. And the, uh, more imp the most important one is the relaxation process between the two bands, so the interband uh, scattering. 
Now the uh, the main point of this um, of this work is that uh, when this interband relaxation is uh, has a non-trivial structure in energy or in momentum, so when, for example, it's peaked uh, at k equals zero, which corresponds to uh, the the smaller uh, the uh, the point of minimum gap. Uh, then it's possible to increase uh, the number of carriers in a conduction band by applying an electric field, even without Landau's inner tunneling. And the reason is that uh, when you apply an electric field, you're uh, increasing the energy of the electrons in a conduction band. So you're essentially sweeping the, the electrons away from the minimum of the gap to higher energies in uh, the conduction band. And uh, these higher energies have a less efficient relaxation. So these electrons, which live at higher energy, uh, where they should not be in equilibrium, they can survive longer because the relaxation rate here is, uh, is smaller. So essentially, you can um, uh, have this effect in which you are increasing the number of electrons in, uh, uh, in conduction band. And this can uh, lead to destabilization of the uh, insulating phase. And what we see is actually, and we actually see that in, uh, in the phase diagram. So you can uh, have uh, we plot the uh, behavior of the insulating gap as function of temperature and for different electric, applied electric fields. And we see that uh, when we increase enough the, the electric fields, then uh, um, there is no uh, insulating phase above a certain temperature. So we need both a combination of uh, uh, base temperature, equilibrium temperature of the system, and large fields to destroy this, uh, uh, this insulating phase. Uh, and also what we see is that there is a joule heating of the, uh, of the electrons. Uh, so uh, if we uh, look at the distribution of the electrons in, uh, uh, in conduction band, we find that uh, it can be described by uh, a Fermi-Dirac distribution with a renormalized temperature and effective temperature, which is T, the equilibrium temperature, plus the joule heating term. So how efficient, so how much heat you generate by joule heating uh, compared to how uh, fast you can, the system can dissipate energy. And uh, in our work, we also did something similar to what Han and collaborators did in, uh, in, their, in their paper. So we looked at the, uh, sort of non-equilibrium pseudo free energy. So what we did was essentially to start from the self consistent equation from for uh, the gap delta, and then just integrate this equation over delta so that we obtain a functional whose uh, local minima give us whose stationary points give us the solutions for uh, the self consistent equation. And uh, in theory, there is no guarantee that. Um, looking at uh, the, like making a comparison of the values of the, this pseudo free energy uh, indicate what, what space is stable and what is metastable and so on. But like this can be, uh, can give us an idea of like where the system uh, wants to be. So like whether the system wants to be in the insulating phase or uh, uh, metallic phase at different electric fields. And we find some results which are uh, uh, similar, like this is uh, equivalent to uh, was found in uh, that other paper. So, uh, so this was like more of an introduction to the theory models that uh, I've been used to try to describe these uh, uh, transitions driven by uh, current or voltage. But the, the main point is that from all these works, uh, uh, the, uh, the takeaway point is that you need a large enough field to uh, heat up the electrons enough uh, so that uh, the insulating phase becomes unstable. So like it seems from all these models that the, the driving mechanism in uh, this uh, driven transition is actually heating of, uh, heating of the system. So you want to have a large enough field to cause a large enough heating of the, the system and destabilize the insulator. But uh, as I was mentioning, this does not really explain, does not see, seems to not explain the uh, very small threshold field you have in, uh, uh, cut smooth in this material. Now, just to give a brief introduction, so cut is uh, a system with uh, uh, with the main different phases. So you can see them here in uh, this space diagram. But what we will focus on is uh, the 
transition, which happens at uh, around 350 Kelvin from a paramagnetic insulating phase to a paraman paramagnetic metallic phase. So we don't have to deal with uh, any magnetic uh, effects. We just have a we just have a transition from an insulator to a metal, which can actually be uh, described by a typical motor insulator behavior. So we have electrons, uh, so like the relevant um, uh, electrons near the Fermi energy, uh, they occupy some half field bands. So like that's the perfect in those are the perfect ingredients to have uh, a mot like behavior. So there is this transition from insulator to metal, and this transition is also associated to a change in the structure of the lattice. So there is a difference. Uh, I mean, this is a, a very complicated material. Like there are uh, many, many atoms in the unit cell. So like it's can get, if you, if you look in, in detail, it can get arbitrarily complicated. But the point is that there is a difference in uh, uh, the lattice params. And so in the, in the parameters of the unit cell. So for example, the uh, length of the cell in the Z direction changes across the transition. This can, this can actually be seen by uh, in uh, like very clean in a very clean way in uh, many experiments. There is if you measure the lattice parameter of, uh, of calcium glutinate, then you see that you can drive the transition with temperature, and you see this clear jump in uh, uh, in the lattice parameter at the transition temperature. Or you can also drive the transition using applying pressure to the material. So. This is like a very clear indicator of when uh, of where the transition is happening. As I was mentioning, there is uh, this transition can also be driven by applying an electric field with a very low threshold field, which is like 40 volts per centimeter. So it's a very small field. And you can see that uh, by doing the same measurement for uh, the lattice parameter as function of the applied electric field. And you can see very clearly this jump in. Uh, in the parameter at this threshold field. And uh, you also see that in, uh, this, uh, uh, in the current versus voltage characteristics. So you go from a very, uh, very low con uh, conductivity here in the insulating phase, and then you jump at the threshold field, and then you have a conductivity, which is metallic, indication of a metallic behavior. So now the point is that from the, uh, uh, from the experiments, uh, it seems that the, uh, the global joule heating of the system is small. So they uh, calculated how much the system is heated up uh, when you apply this much electric field, this much voltage, and uh, they can only account for an increase of, in temperature of around 10 Kelvin. While there is, uh, these experiments are conducted at room temperature and the transition temperature is like 80, 80 degrees. So there is uh, uh, an increase in, so to have a heating effect, you should have an increase in temperature of at least 50 or 60 degrees uh, Kelvin, which does not seem to happen to, to be explained by, uh, the, uh, the, by joule heating. Now, the, uh, the last experiment I want to talk about, and then I will uh, uh, go on and talk about the modeling of the system, is this uh, nano imaging ex experiment. So uh, there was this uh, group in Stony Brook that was uh, able to uh, basically uh, take pictures of, uh, of the system. So this is a sample of uh, this material, calcium glutinate, at different currents. And they can see, uh, in, they can resolve between the two different phases. So like using the fact that the structure of the lattice is different in uh, the metallic and insulating phase, they are able to tell apart the insulating phase, which is uh, represented in this gray, light, light gray color from the metallic phase, which is as this darker shade of gray color. So they, can, they are able to actually tell uh, for every current they apply, uh, where the, where the system is, met, is metallic and where the system is insulating. And what they see is that when you start from zero current at uh, room temperature, so you start from uh, an insulator and then you start applying current and then you can see that uh, the system starts turning metallic. Uh, and minus V and plus V here are uh, uh, the, the points where you apply the electrodes so where uh, you inject current into, uh, into the system. And they see that increasing the current, uh, the so this, uh, the interface between uh, metallic phase and uh, uh, insulating phase uh, grows, so like it expands across the system until when you go to 
uh, the, to larger currents, you, uh, the entire sample becomes metallic. So they found basically a, a region of currents, a range of currents in which there is coexistence between the metallic and insulating phase in the system. And then they also saw this very surprising thing, which is that uh, the metallic phase always nucleates out of uh, the negative electrode. So they basically uh, did the experiment in which the negative electrode is on the right side of the, the, of the system. And then they see that the metallic phase comes out uh, from this negative electrode when they apply a certain current. And then they switch the polarity. So they put the negative electrode on the uh, left side of the material. And so at this time, the uh, metallic phase came out from the left side. So always from the uh, negative electrode. So this is kind of surprising because the system somehow knows about the direction of the current. So there is something which depends on the direction of the current. This is kind of like rare in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, physical systems. And so also, also this, uh, this effect uh, tells us that, like, that joule heating is uh, very likely not the main effect here at play here, uh, because joule heating depends on uh, uh, the current squared. So it does not care about the direction of the current. Uh, while the system uh, somehow knows where uh, the where you are injecting the current, where you're uh, taking it out of the system. So uh, all these uh, these experiments uh, just to try uh, and uh, think of the, of the the this phenomenon in uh, calcium modeling in a different way. Uh, and uh, the work I did with uh, my advisor and Emilio at Columbia is uh, reported in this paper here from uh, last year. And uh, so the main issue, so some of the main points here are that. The presence of the interface is uh, very likely important for uh, uh, the physics for uh, the physics of the transition uh, because there is a you can see in the experiment in this experiment there is a coexistence of phases so the interface is likely to play a role in, uh, in the transition and also uh, while the uh, global joule heating while the the global heating effect may be small. It is possible locally you have a larger effect. So in particular, when uh, uh, you're injecting current uh, in an inhomogeneous way, so like you have uh, a bigger current density near the, um, the electrodes where you're injecting current, then, it's possible, then there you have a larger heating. So you have a situation which is not homogeneous. So locally you may have regions where uh, you have larger heating than uh, the average sample. And then there is the issue of, uh, uh, the polarity of the uh, dependence on the direction of the current. And uh, the, the main point is that this may, uh, is very likely related to thermoelectric effects uh, since uh, thermoelectric effects are actually uh, dependent on uh, uh, linearly on the current. So it's possible that we can uh, uh, interpret the, uh, what is going on here in this material as, uh, as the consequence of some Peltier heating. And I will explain later what this uh, means exactly. So to study this system, we basically brought down some uh, macroscopic equations for um, the local temperature of, uh, of the system. So we consider the temperature not as uh, the system as a whole, but like locally. So we had a local uh, uh, equation. We also took into account the presence of an interface. So basically, uh, we consider a system uh, which can have a... Uh, so the system has a length L, width W, and uh, thickness H. And this system is resting on a substrate which uh, basically acts as a, a heat reservoir. So it's like a buff uh, at fixed temperature T0. And then uh, our system uh, can have uh, like existence of both metallic and insulating phases. So we have uh, a metallic phase. So here, uh, there is a, just a sketch of a, a possible geometry, which is a wedge-like geometry. So it's like uh, the electrode, one of the electrodes will be here, and there is a metallic phase uh, nucleating out of this electrode. And then there is an insulating phase, and there is current flowing in the system. And what we do is to write a uh, balance equation for uh, the heat uh, in, uh, uh, in the system uh, so that we can determine the temperature of the electrons and the temperature of the uh, lattice. So for the electrons, we have that in, uh, in a steady state, we have zero equal to, then we have 
the joule heating, which uh, heats up the system, is uh, the resistivity of the, uh, the electrons times the current squared. And then we have this uh, Peltier heat uh, term, which is basically, uh, which is minus the temperature T times the current density J times the gradient of the C by coefficient. And, uh, and then we have the uh, diffusive term in which uh, we, uh, in which the uh, temperature, in which there is diffusion of heat uh, proportional to the conductivity, thermal conductivity of the electrons. And then there is an exchange of energy between uh, the electrons and the lattice. So basically the electrons can dissipate the energy produced by Joule heating and these other effects into the lattice by exchanging energy with the lattice. And then we can uh, write down the equation for, uh, for the balance equation for the lattice. So we're always in a steady state. We have zero equal to, we have diffusion of, um, uh, of energy of heat for the lattice. And then we have plus uh, the energy, which is exchange, which is, which is flowing from the electrons into the lattice. Uh, and now the important thing is that the, lat the, the lattice is the only one that can dissipate energy into the external environment. So, through the substrate, uh, there can be diffusion of energy. So the, our system can lose uh, heat by diffusing um, energy into the substrate at the, uh, at the interface, at the bottom surface of the system. So we have, we impose the boundary condition that the temperature of the lattice at Z equal H, so at the bottom surface of the system is equal to T0. And basically what we can do is solve these equations and find the uh, temperature of the electrons uh, uh, and of the lattice at any point in, uh, in the system. Now, so we was uh, saying this Peltier effect, uh, this term minus J times the gradient of uh, the Seebeck coefficient uh, is very good for, uh, for us because one is linear in J and uh, also depends on uh, the direction of J. So it depends on the direction of the current. So it correctly gives the uh, polarity effect we uh, the, uh, the experiment was uh, telling us there is in uh, calcium glutinate. And uh, uh, more importantly, uh, when the current flows from the phase with the larger Seebeck coefficient to the phase with lower, with the lower Seebeck coefficient, uh, there is generation of heat at the interface. So this term here is positive. So you produce heat at the interface. So you are heating the system. And it's actually consistent with calcium glutinate because in this material, uh, the Seebeck coefficient in the metallic phase is uh, approximately zero. And in, in, in the insulating phase is large and positive. So it means that when the current flows from the insulator to the metal, then there is heating at the interface, which corresponds to a situation in which the metallic phase uh, nucleates out of the uh, negative electrode. So it's actually consistent with the uh, pictures I, I was showing you earlier here, in which the metallic phase comes out of the, the negative electrode. Uh, and then also there is this, um, uh, the point that uh, this effect, this Peltier heating effect term is proportional to the gradient of the Seebeck coefficient. And since the Seebeck coefficient has this big jump at the interface between the insulator and the metal, there will be a large generation of it at the interface, which will compete with the diffusion and dissipation. And, uh, so concerning dissipation, we can uh, model it uh, as just linearly in the temperature difference between the uh, electron temperature and uh, the lattice temperature. And the point is that this coefficient here, which tells us how fast the exchange of energy happens between electrons and lattice is usually very large. So this, um, uh, this exchange of energy is very fast, uh, which means that uh, we can uh, assume uh, that uh, the temperature of the electrons and of the lattice are uh, at all times almost the same. So like the difference between the two temperatures here is uh, much smaller than the te temperature itself. So we can approximate, so we can uh, reduce our two temperatures model to just one temperature model for the system. Of course, this, now this uh, more, uh, like if we want to go more, more in detail, this actually depends on the thickness of the system. But the point is that uh, for uh, this material, same, the systems are usually thick enough for uh, uh, these two temperatures to be very close to each other. So we don't have to worry about a difference in temperature between electrons and lattice. And basically we can just write down one heat balance equation for just one temperature in which now the thermal conductivity 
is uh, given by the sum of the two thermal conductivities of, uh, of, the, of the system, of the electrons and lattice. And uh, the uh, boundary condition at the bottom surface is that the temperature is equal to, uh, to T0, to the bath temperature. Uh, and this, uh, so this uh, uh, essentially, so this boundary condition tells us that this diffusion into the substrate, into the environment, is the only way for the system to dissipate heat, the heat generated by Joule heating or Peltier heating. And in particular, uh, very fixed samples, very fixed system dissipate less efficiently because the dissipation is proportional to uh, kappa times the temperature divided by the thickness h of the system squared. So uh, the fact that like, these uh, calcium rooted systems are usually larger than uh, uh, typical samples for other materials actually tells us that dissipation may be uh, very inefficient in these systems. Now we can uh, take this equation and uh, for a given uh, a current injected into the system, uh, we can uh, solve everything for, for the temperature. And uh, what we find, uh, so we can, uh, we can uh, get like some uh, analytical uh, insight for like very specific cases, but uh, maybe we'll skip this and uh, just go to uh, the numerical uh, results for uh, uh, the like for for the system. So uh, basically, I did I solved this uh, this equations numerically for uh, uh, certain uh, parameter values which are consistent with uh, the experiments for uh, uh, this material for calcium rutenate. And I found that there is, a, as you can see from these plots, from this color map of the temperature, there is a substantial increase of the temperature of, uh, of the system. And uh, the temperature can even go above the trans equilibrium trans transition temperature. So you can have a separation, uh, formation of metallic phases near the negative electrode, uh, while the rest of the system uh, stays insulating, stays, stays insulator. And uh, you see that in, uh, uh, from a side view here, uh, in which you see the, the metallic phase that goes uh, down to a certain depth of the system. And then from a top view in which you see also the, this uh, semicircular shape of the uh, metallic phase coming out of the negative electrode. And you can also observe like how the, uh, the 1D profile of the temperature on the, line, on the line joining the two electrodes here. So this shows that uh, for uh, certain parameters for uh, a current which is uh, for a value of the current which is consistent uh, with the experiments, uh, we can actually induce the, this transition simply uh, uh, from the Peltier heating generated at the interface between the, uh, met the metallic phase and the insulating phase. And uh, then I did a check in which I uh, reduced the value of the seedback coefficients by uh, one order of magnitude. And I saw that uh, to uh, see a transition, so to uh, nucleate some metallic phase, I need to increase the current. But in um, uh, for this value of the seedback coefficient, uh, the uh, Joule heating became way more important. So the uh, phase, the the phase uh, interface, the phase boundary looked way more symmetrical. So there was also a metallic phase nucleating out of the positive electrode which means that in this case, the seedback coefficient is less important. So Joule heating, which is symmetric in the direction of the current is the, uh, main, uh, is the main mechanism of driving the transition. So you will expect something which is very symmetric. And then you can also look at a different geometry of the system. So instead of like a square geometry, I looked at the rectangular geometry and uh, you can see how increasing the current leads to uh, different shapes to the interface. So you can see that the metallic phase, uh, the boundary between metal insulator, pushes through uh, halfway through the sample. Uh, okay, and then I just want to show one last experiment. So this like, uh, this data were uh, published uh, shortly after we uh, published our, uh, our theoretical model. And uh, uh, in this experiment, they, uh, it's like, by a group in uh, Kyoto University in Japan, who were able to measure the local temperature. So they were, uh, they did some infrared imaging of the calcium rutenate and under different currents. And they were able to measure the local temperature of, um, of the system. And you can see from uh, this color map that there is uh, 
this asymmetry uh, between the electrons. So you have like the negative electron here and the positive electron here in, the, in this picture, for example. And you can see how the negative electron does a, high, has a larger temperature, so like it's hotter here, while the positive electron uh, is uh, slightly colder than the negative electron. You can see also that in the plots on, uh, on the right. So basically they found that uh, reversing the polarity of the current uh, you also you always see that uh, the negative electrode is slightly hotter than um, the positive one. So they basically so, so this data basically confirm that uh, Peltier heating is actually relevant in uh, in this system. And you can see actually the difference in temperature uh, uh, between the two electrodes is linear in temperature. It's linear in the temperature. So showing that uh, this um, uh, this Peltier heating is actually one of the main mechanisms uh, responsible for uh, the transition in uh, calcium rutenate. Okay, so in conclusion, in uh, this work, I studied this uh, metal insulator transition in uh, this specific material, in, uh, this uh, rutenate, driven by a, an applied current. And uh, using some uh, macroscopic equations for uh, the local temperature, I found that uh, the, uh, the interface between the metallic and insulating phase, there can be a large Peltier heating uh, due to the difference in uh, the CBA coefficient between the two phases. And this can lead to polarity dependent effects, uh, which can actually explain the uh, driving of the transition in uh, calcium rutenate. Uh, so we, we explained that this, uh, this transition here um, is due to a heating caused by this Peltier effect. Uh, and not to some purely electronic uh, uh, mechanism uh, happening in the system. With this, I want to thank for your attention. I will be happy to take any, any question. Right. Um, are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe I have a question also, oh, Andre. Andre, please. Uh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's rather well, just a curiosity for me. I remember a few years ago there was a story about calcium ruthenate and uh, the observation of the Higgs mode and uh, the subsequent decay of this mode. Um, the story was that uh, basically this ground state is uh, spin orbit singlet. Uh, with at some temperature, there was excitation of triplets, uh, which leads to this Higgs mode. Uh, but there were other claims uh, that uh, the system is actually can be described as Heisenberg antiferromagnet. Um, uh, are you talking about calcium rutinate or? Yeah, uh, yeah calcium rutinate. Okay. Because, okay, so uh, here I'm uh, focusing on. Uh, this higher temperature transition. So it's like the one at 350 Kelvin. Uh, so it's between uh, two paramagnetic phases. Uh, I think you are referring to the transition. So there is a second transition between antiferromagnetic phase and uh, paramagnetic phase, lower temperature. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm yeah, not sure. Uh, yes, yeah, so I didn't study that. I'm not sure what. Uh, what you're asking for. Uh, yeah, it, I think it's a bit low temperature. So yeah, I was just interested in how it's applied to this uh, study. And yeah, so any relation or not, I see. Uh, so uh, there have been some more recent experiments in which the applied current at lower temperature uh, and they saw like a transition to uh, a metallic behavior, but I uh, I didn't study in detail the the moderate dose temperature. In, th in theory, uh, the the equations I wrote should be should describe the system also lower temperature, provided that I use the parameters for uh, uh, for calcium order at that temperature. So I need the C B coefficient, the values of the C B coefficient, resistivity, and so on uh, at this uh, at the temperature of this transition. I didn't try to do that, honestly. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
I have a uh, like question. Like, I mean, is there is there a physical reason why uh, to understand why this effective temperature is proportional to the applied field? Uh, you mean uh, for the Peltier heating term, or uh, yeah. uh, so? Okay, that, uh, maybe the my microscopic uh, level. Uh, so the idea is um, so here what uh, uh, what in like this model, this picture here is uh, for electrons in conduction band, and when you apply an electric field, you are basically heating up these electrons, so you are. Uh, giving energy to these electrons and the energy you are giving is proportional to E squared to the Joule heating term, more or less. And then you are uh, dissipating energy with uh, some rate, uh, gamma epsilon, for example, there is like some, there will, like, there, will, there will be many processes with which you can dissipate energy. So it's basically a balance of like how, how much energy uh, over time you are giving uh, to the electrons through Joule heating and how much, how fast you can dissipate the energy uh, through several processes, which it, which depend like on the microscopic model of the system. So basically, the renormalization in temperature will be proportional to Joule heating divided by the rate of relaxation. I don't know if this answers uh, your question completely. Mm, yeah, I mean, I mean. I'm a bit confused because it, 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 uh, maybe we can discuss it later. Like, uh, I mean, it, it, the, uh, I wonder it, um, it should be proportional to the E square and why is it proportional to E? It's, uh, because of the dissipation is basically proportional to E. Uh, okay, so, uh, no, sorry. Uh, so here uh, in this model here, it's proportional I mean, it, to E squared. Okay, I know, I think uh, maybe go back one. For, yes, uh, yes, so you're right here, it's yeah. proportional yeah. to E. Uh, it's because they are using a fermionic buff, basically. It's like uh, the, um, because the nature of the normal, it's like the dissipation is uh, slightly different. Uh, and basically, okay, maybe I didn't show it here, but if, when they study this model at finite temperature, so they, they study this at uh, zero temperature, but then if you also, if you take instead the fermionic buff to have a finite temperature, um, the formula for uh, the effective temperature is the square root of this quantity squared plus the temperature of the buff squared. So you have a correction, so you always have a correction which is proportional to the square of the, uh, or the electric field, but uh, since in this case you start from a fermionic buff at zero temperature, then uh, mm -hmm. they simplify and get this uh, this thing linear. But it depends on the man on the on the absolute value of the electric field. In any case. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I think uh, we have some question. Yes. So. You may have mentioned it uh, during your talk, but in which case uh, mm -hmm. I, I missed it. But this difference of temperature between the, um, the anode and the cathode, mm -hmm. can, it can be understood as far as I, uh, as I, as, as I get it, as a, a breaking of the particle hole symmetry. However, my question is, where in your description does this um, breaking of the particle hole symmetry uh, occur? Was it the explicitly in the in the microscopic model, or was it uh, is it a spontaneous uh, breaking? I might have missed uh, that part. Yeah, no, yeah, no. That's, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, so like it's implicit in the structure of the, the system, the microscopic model. I didn't I didn't show it here, but uh, you can see like essentially the Seebeck coefficient uh, is a measure of particle hole asymmetry. So if you have a completely symmetric uh, structure, then the Seebeck coefficient is zero. And this is actually what you have in the metallic phase where uh, calcium rootedness is quite symmetric between particles and holes. While in uh, the insulating phase, uh, if you look at the uh, energy structure and the density of states of the system near the Fermi energy, you have an asymmetry between particles and holes. 
and this lead to leads to this uh, C by coefficient being uh, different from zero. So uh, essentially, I would say that um, the breaking of symmetry uh, is uh, is like hidden in uh, the fact that this gradient of a uh, C by coefficient is non zero. So if you have if you have no, no symmetry breaking, then S is zero and uh, you have like the, this term disappears. So you have, you don't have this effect. Yes. Okay. But this cannot be seen by looking at only the, the dispersion relation and the feelings, right? Uh, I mean, it, it didn't look to be the case in the few graphs that you show afterwards. Mm, no, uh, I mean. So it's really, a breaking in terms of the transport properties. Yes, I guess you could say that. Uh, yeah, it's just like a symmetry breaking at the level of a microscopic structure in the insulating phase. Mm. It's like, uh, I mean, I, uh, you can look at, you can find that there is this asymmetry if you do like ab initio calculation for uh, the energy structure, or if you look at the experiment, there are some experiments measuring uh, the, uh, the density of states of the, of the system or uh, the CBA coefficient, and you can see this, uh, this asymmetry. But uh, from like a more intuitive level, I, I don't know very mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Mm. So if not, let's thank the speaker. And, uh, and uh, this I think brings the end to our session with this two very nice talk. And, uh, and also today. So I'll hand over the stage to Pire. And yeah. So what do we do from now? We, we need so, so thank you, Aritra, for sharing the session. So before um, closing uh, the session and the day for this conference, I would like only to remind you some, uh, some technical information for tomorrow. So uh, tomorrow the conference will start at nine. If possible, it would be very nice for the speakers to try to connect uh, 10 to 15 minutes before to, to try if everything is working for them. Um, and also, uh, as you may see, the program has been updated. And so we have confirmed uh, that we have a um, photo session tomorrow after 12. So directly after the last talk of the, um, of the third session tomorrow morning, we will have um, a, photo, a photo session where both all the speakers and all the participants are welcomed. Okay, so you will sure receive um, an email with the, with the link to the Zoom meeting and not the Zoom webinar. To, to connect at that time, but I will remind that to you uh, tomorrow as well, so that we can have a group photo. It doesn't replace the, the real face, face to face, but it's the best that we can do uh, online. And that's about it with the technical information that uh, I wanted to tell you. So I thank you again for your participation and I hope to see you tomorrow for more uh, interesting uh, talks. <laughs>